Let us pray. God, like, like Paula said, bless us with my words. But let my words be your words this morning, God. Let us feel your presence. And let us hear your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. Last week, Pastor John talked about uh, the question that God has for us, which, which was, where are you? And John even pointed out that in, in some translations, it says, where are you hiding? Now, hiding is one thing, but getting, getting lost is a different thing. How many of you ever got lost as a kid? I got lost um, when I was about four years old at the Anderson Jockey Lot. <laughs> and I, I, by hearing all the laughs, many of you have been to the Anderson Jockey Lot, so you know I was lost. Obviously, they found me, <laughs> and we made it, we made it back to, um, to where we are. But maybe if you didn't get lost when you were, when you were a kid... Do you ever remember your brother or your sister getting lost? And what it, what's the first question out of your parents' mouth when your brother or your sister gets lost? When your brother gets lost? Where's your brother? That's what they want to know. They ask you like you did it. <laughs> We're going to read the story of Cain and Abel this morning. And that's the question that God has for us. Where is your brother? But before we read that story um, in Genesis, my parents told me this story uh, last week, and hopefully I get most of the details right. But they were at Hobby Lobby a week or so ago, and they got behind this young lady who was in line, and she had three kids with her all by herself. It was not my wife. <laughs> but, <laughs> but all the kids had to be under five, if not even younger kind of like our three kids. But she had two boys, and the youngest was a girl. Is that right? The two boys were picking out some candy or something there at the counter, and the mom was telling them, pick one and come on. Pick one and come on. Trying to get them out the door. And I, can just, I, I know how that is, struggling. And as she was checking out, the middle child comes up with something else. And he's going, pay for it, Mama, pay for it. And she says, no, you already got one. Put it back. So she finally got through the checkout line, and the two-year-old, why is it always the middle child that's the wild one? I don't know what, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Are you the middle child? <laughs> anyway, the two-year-old, would not, he would not leave the store. He did not want to go. He wanted to stay. So the mama used the trick that all parents know, which is, okay, bye. And she walked out the door. Only it didn't work. He still wasn't coming. He was staying in the store. And when she got outside with the other two, she turned to her oldest boy, and I'm taking a little creative liberty here, but she probably said something like, where is your brother? Where is your brother? Now, I don't know for sure if she said that, but I do know that she said something like, go get your brother. Because he went back in and got his little brother in a headlock and dragged him out of the store. <laughs> So she was, the, the, at this point, my parents came out and they approached the young lady who was still standing there trying to figure out how to get across the parking lot safely with three kids. And they said, my son and, and daughter-in-law have three kids. We understand what's going on here. Can we help you? And she was um, probably a little skeptical, but probably also a little desperate. So she, she said, okay, thank you. And my dad picked up the two-year-old to carry him out to the car and immediately he started screaming, Mama, Mama, Mama. And she said, See? See what happens when you won't stay with me? <laughs> so my dad put him down and said, Okay, here, hold your mama's hand. Still wouldn't do it. So then my mom asked if she could hold the baby so the mama could wrangle the wild one. And then my mom ended up getting some sort of white chocolate pretzel stain thing the baby was chewing on all over her shirt. But they got the three kids to the car, and the mama was grateful, and she will probably never leave the house again. <laughs> but I want to go back to the question, where is your brother? 
If you've got your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 4. And we'll be reading verses 1 through 9. And if you don't have your Bible, we should have it on the screen for you. And it's printed in your bulletin. If you don't have a Bible, find somebody after the service with a name tag and we will get you one free of charge. But Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Now I'm going to stop right here for just a minute, and, and I want to ask the question, why did God not accept Cain's offering? I struggled with this for a long time. And by a long time, I don't mean this week. You got an answer? Okay. Close. But how is it fair that God just decided to accept one offering and not the other? I didn't understand this for years. When this whole situation had just been avoided, and, you, and if, if you know the rest of the story, Cain kills his brother Abel. But wouldn't this whole situation have been avoided if God just accepted both offerings? So I want to read to you again verses 3 and 4, and I want you to, I want you to make sure you see the whole picture. And wa watch the words that are used. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. There's a subtle difference there. Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil. But Abel brought fat portions, the best part of the firstborn of his flock. He said there was no blood in the vegetables. He poured his blood, sweat, and tears into the crops. But he didn't bring the first portion. He didn't bring the best part. He brought some. That's the difference. Abel didn't bring the leftovers. He didn't bring an offering after he had already had his fill, he brought an offering from the first, from the first born of his flock. He brought the best part of the firstborn, as God requires. See, God, God wants the best of us. He doesn't want the rest of us. He doesn't want your leftovers. He wants your best. He wants your first fruits. And this isn't even what the sermon is about, but... What is it in your life that takes precedence over the Lord? Is it your job, your house, your kids? I mean, most of us would probably not say that we value our job over the Lord. But when He calls you to do something, do you, do you stop and think, well, that can't be Him calling me because... He knows I've got to go to work. Or do your kids take precedence over the Lord? Do you let other, other needs go unmet to meet your kids' needs? Which I think is okay. We should, part of the sacrifice of being a parent is letting some things go. Letting some needs go unmet so that you can meet your kids' needs. That's part of the sacrifice of being a parent. But we have to be really careful how we define needs we should make trade-offs to spend time with our family but the question is are you making conscious trade-offs in order to spend time with your family or or spend time with the Lord or are you letting your job or your house or your kids become an excuse I didn't mean for that to go on that long so let's get back to the story Abel's firstborn offering was accepted and Cain's offering was not pick back up in verse 6 then the Lord said to Cain why are you angry why is your face downcast if you do what is right will you not be accepted but if you do not do what is right sin is crouching at your door it desires to have you but you must rule over it now Cain said to his brother Abel let's go out to the field 
While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Now there are actually two questions here. And the first one is the question that God asks us, Where is your brother? And the second question is what our natural response is. Am I my brother's keeper? Now God, God knew where Abel was. If you continue on to verse 10, God says, Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. God knew exactly where Abel was. Cain knew where Abel was. He killed him. So why did God ask? And why does Cain lie? I think it goes back to what, what Pastor John said last week. When we fall or when we fail, we want to hide. We don't want to admit that we did wrong. We want to ignore the problem and hope it goes away. We want to ask God, am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for my brother? Why is it up to me to keep up with him? And I kept, I kept wanting to go to the story of the Good Samaritan. I don't know if you know the story. It, it's a great story to read. And it starts in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, if you want to read it. But... Um, you probably have a rough idea of what the Good Samaritan means when somebody says the words the Good Samaritan. But in that story, a young man asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? But I want to point out that in Genesis, God did not ask us, where is your neighbor? He asked us, where is your brother? So now you might be wondering, well, then who is my brother? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me take you to Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. I think we're going to have this on the screen for you too. Um, While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus says, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. That kind of narrows it down a little bit. So this is why I didn't go to the story of the Good Samaritan. Because to me, your neighbor is literally anyone you come in contact with. But your brother or your sister, that's a different definition that's a lot more specific and I also want to take you to um, Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 through 10 which says do not be deceived God cannot be mocked a man reaps what he sows whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Let us do good to all people. That, that is abundantly clear. But that's not the whole sentence. Let us do good to all people, especially those who are in the family of believers, who belong to the family of believers. Take a look around you. Look to your left and your right. Look at the people. Make eye contact. (laughs) These are your brothers and your sisters. These are those that belong to the family of believers. The Baptist church down the road belongs to the family of believers. So do the Pentecostals and the Lutherans and the Presbyterians and the messianic jews and i could go on and on but we're all a part of the family of believers but even so even so god did not say where is your eighth cousin three times removed he said where's your brother i want to make it clear that i'm not saying that we shouldn't care for our neighbor it is important to care for all people to be concerned for those that aren't in this building 
but that belong to the family of, of believers. Brother, a brother is something different. Your brother is different than your neighbor. Your brother is different than your cousin. And when God asks, where is your brother? Our natural response is to say, am I my brother's keeper? And I'd like to submit that, yes, you are your brother's keeper. And listen, when I say brother, I do mean brother and sister. It's just if I repeat that over and over, I'm going to get tongue-tied. But what's so funny, we want to say, am I my brother's keeper? But when we're little kids, we absolutely believe that we're our brother's keeper. If I tell my oldest Sperry to, put his, to put, go put his shoes on, his first response is, Walker's not putting his shoes on. He is quick to tell me what Walker is doing. And my wife tells him all the time, worry about yourself. He sure thinks he's his brother's keeper. He wants to make sure his brother's doing what he's supposed to be doing. But your brother is different than your neighbor. And I'm pointing that out because there are those of us who will be the first to sign up for a mission trip. For Salkahatchee or for whatever. And I'm not, I am not saying that those are bad things. I'm not. I believe in mission trips. I believe in Salkahatchee. In fact, like John said, I'm doing the devotions every night for Salkahatchee this week. I think it's that important. And mission trips and, and, and mission projects in like Salkahatchee and going to foreign countries are wonderful, wonderful, necessary experiences. But... Jesus, um, I'm sorry, those are things we should be doing. I don't want to take anything away from those. Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be witnesses, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth. We should be going. But it starts in Jerusalem. He said, in Jerusalem, and then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. It starts at home. Should you go on a mission trip to Honduras, Nicaragua, or China, or wherever, you know, wherever? Yes. If you feel called to do that, you absolutely should. Should you go to Somerville, Salkahatchee, or Creekside, Salkahatchee? Some of our campers just from our church just came back. Yes, you should go do those things. If God is calling you to do that. Should you help out here in town with Emerald City, Salkahatchee? Yes. You should. You should help out with these missions and ministries in, in any way that you can. Be it your, your prayers, your gifts, your presence, your service, your witness. These are your neighbors. You should do good to all people. But don't neglect your brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to take you to one more place in Scripture. And that's Isaiah 58, verses 6 and 7. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. The New Living Translation reads, Do not hide from relatives who need your help. There are all those wonderful things that we should be doing. The kind of fasting that God wants. Free the wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free. Remove the chains that bind people. Share your food. Give shelter. Give clothes. But do not hide from your relatives who need your help. So I said we should go to all those places and serve, but shame on us if we'll go to Nicaragua or Somerville or Newberry or 96 but we won't help the person next to us in the row on Sunday morning. I want to challenge you. Is there someone in your life, someone you see on a regular basis that you know nothing about? 
Is there someone at work that you see every day that you interact with, but you've never stopped to ask about their family or how they're doing and actually cared? Where is your brother? Is there someone sitting near you, in here, that you don't know anything about? You don't know where they live, what they do for a living. You might not even remember their name. And you feel a little embarrassed because you feel like you should remember their name. Go and, I want to challenge you to go and ask. Get to know that person. We're going to pray together and then we're going to have one more song. And during this time of prayer, um, I want you to pray for, pray specifically for that person that you thought of. And you might have 20 people come to mind because you're an introvert like me and there's a bunch of people you feel like you should know their names but you cannot remember. It's okay. Pick one. I'm not asking you to go to the ends of the earth yet. I'm not asking you to go to Judea and Samaria yet. I'm asking you to go to Jerusalem to start here. And this just hit me. When is the last time you stopped and asked your spouse how they were doing? When is the last time you tried to think of a way to lighten their burden? Let us pray. God, show us that person that we've been shy about introducing ourselves to. And God, give us the courage to just break the ice. And if we can't, for the life of us, remember their name, give us the courage to ask. Give us the strength to help our brothers and sisters. Remind us that we should do good to all people. We should do good to our neighbors. But also remind us that we are our brother's keeper. God, hear, hear the minds and hear the thoughts of your people as we focus on that person that you're calling us to reach out to. Hear our thoughts and prayers. And God, remind us that being our brother's keeper is not an excuse to stay in our holy huddles within these walls but it's a reminder not to not to neglect those relationships that are closest to us amen